Saskatoon Police Service Historical Crimes has uh, Detective Sergeant Grant Little in charge, and I've invited uh, Sergeant Little to come and give us a little bit of the uh, background of the uh, historical case units. Uh, Sergeant, thank you for making time for us today. My pleasure. Uh, maybe talk a little bit about yourself and how you progressed to come through to this historical case unit. Sure. Uh, I'm actually in year 35 of my police career, uh, and for the last about 12 years now, I've been working major crime section, uh, primarily obviously on death and homicide investigations. And in 2012, I was transferred into the uh, what we call the historical case unit, what people often refer to as cold case, but the, the terminology used in this day and age is historical cases. The, uh, I recall with the old uh, police station and the temporary forensic lab that you had, it was kind of a makeshift uh, type of thing. Uh, some advancements have happened over the years in terms of the ability to be able to solve these types of crimes. Absolutely, and that's uh, the biggest the biggest change in, in what's occurred in police investigations is actual science and the improvement of science. Uh, and it's not just the advent of DNA, obviously that was a huge uh, thing in police investigations, but as time goes by, that science actually gets better and better. And I have no doubt we'll get better in the future. And that's not all there is in science, there's other areas of science that have improved that allow us to do things or link things forensically that we were never able to do before. I realize, uh, you know, just out and about in the community, everyone has opinions and so on, but I, I know that there's a demographic that was around when uh, Alexandria Wilchark died in 1962. Uh, can you give us some sense of what's happened uh, from that time frame to today and, and where we're at with that particular case? That's uh, a we don't have near enough time, I'll tell you that up front, Randy. Uh, the reality is a lot has happened. Uh, a lot has happened over the years, a lot has changed over the years. Uh, things like DNA were not even thought of until probably two to three decades after the actual murder. Uh, in 2004, uh, the remains of the victim were exhumed uh, to collect more evidence. And utilizing what we collected then, we're now utilizing that to uh, compare to potential suspects we have. And that's an ongoing process that continues even as we speak right now. So a file is never technically closed. I think you said that it's uh, right. it kind of ebbs and flows with information that comes available? Correct. We never, until we solve a homicide, it's never fully closed. Some will become inactive while we don't have any particular leads. Currently, uh, Wichark is a very active file. There are things going on right now, which obviously I'm not in a position to sure. discuss with you. Yep. But we are uh, we're investigating it as we speak, and there's a couple other cold cases which we won't talk about today, which are in the same position. Some other cases, depending on if we've hit a wall and we don't have a lead, obviously they go inactive, but we never close the file. If we had a, another one that I believe was solved uh, some years later, it was the Hearts murder. Can you tell Correct. us a bit about that, what happened there? Hearts happened in 1963, so just about a year and a half after Wichark. Um, that was the, uh, a caretaker or sort of a night watchman, if you will, working at Saskatoon Golf and Country Club. Uh, he had been shot uh, during a break-in, uh, and we were able to resolve that uh, by actually matching up matchsticks, paper matchsticks, uh, that were found at the scene uh, with a matchbook uh, that was found in the suspect's vehicle. Um, it was believed at the time, I'm talking back in 1963 now, uh, that likely those matchsticks came from that matchbook. Uh, it's just that science wasn't at a state where they could say yay or nay. It was an undetermined, if you will. Uh, we were able to, um, now the RCMP back in 63, they used to do have a hair and fiber section that would test that kind of thing. Uh, since then they don't. Um, when I contacted them for how do we do this in this day and age, they recommended me to a company in the United States in a place called Elgin, uh, Illinois, which is just outside Chicago, a place called Microtrace. Uh, we sent the matchsticks down there and matched them up, if you will. No pun intended. Yeah. And the success of that was a, a charge that was brought forward? That one, uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to charge. We had been working, we'd actually had a surveillance team on our suspect uh, collecting DNA, which was inconclusive, so we're just shy of building the case. 
Uh, and by the time we got enough evidence, again, 1963, 50 years later, uh, the, uh, our suspect had passed away. Understood. Uh, the Joan Folds case uh, that happened, uh, what transpired there with any successes? Uh, Joan Folds, that's a 1990 file. Um, 23 years after the fact, uh, DNA uh, came to the rescue, if you will, helped to solve that crime. And this is one of those cases where I'm talking about how not only the advent of DNA, but the advancements in DNA, because we had uh, sent our exhibits to the RCMP lab uh, late 90s, 2000, in that time frame, and had run testing uh, and were unsuccessful. Some years later, one may become aware that the science has improved. They're able to generate profiles with much smaller amounts of biological material. Uh, so I got a hold of Ottawa and had a chat and convinced them it would be a good idea to give it the old college try, uh, and they did. And we were able to match it up to an offender. And that person was charged in that crime. Do do police investigative techniques progress over time, I guess, based on what's happened in the court system, or do they, do they kind of advance based on science as well? I, I would say it's actually a combination of the two. Uh, the reality is that files like Hart's, files like Joan Folds, and even the Wachark file, if the sciences were available to the police back then, but are available now, they certainly would have been solved very close to the time of the occurrence. Um, so that advance in science has made a difference as far as the courts and, and what they are looking for the from the police, I should say, and from the investigators. Uh, that has had an impact to a certain extent, uh, but reality is they want, the courts have always wanted evidence documented and have always wanted to rely whenever they can on for want of a better term, hard evidence or forensic evidence. Fingerprints, of course, was the standard for many years. And still a reality today is still one of the highest standards you'll get. Uh, but DNA, those other forensics, are equally important. And when I say hard evidence, compared to witnesses. Uh, witnesses, by and large, 99% of the time, are earnestly trying to help. They really do want to help. But the reality is people make mistakes. They're not trying to mislead the investigators. Uh, they are honestly trying to help. But uh, unless you are, for want of a better term, a professional witness, which police are supposed to be, they're supposed to, when they see something, document it right away, um, it's hard to be able to recall information. And think of any incident you, somebody asks you after the fact, well, what, what did you see? Well, you sit there and you scratch your head, well, I think. And of course, then it gets yeah. tainted because your friend beside you says, well, no, don't you remember? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so witnesses, that, that kind of evidence is not near as strong. And of course, the courts want to rely on the, the reliable evidence, the DNA. So it's been said that there's the, uh, there's the trial of the accused, but there's also the trial of the investigation itself. And I think that's fair to say that the, the work that the, the Saskatoon Police Service is involved in is, is to be commended because files that, that you continually work on are open and there is someone actively pursuing each one of those as, as time goes on. Uh, where do you go for your training and, and up, upkeep with uh, any certification and, and investigative skills that you have? Well, my training, uh, besides obviously the on-the-job training, if you will, I mean, it's the Canadian Police College, uh, both in Ottawa and in Chilliwack. I have trained from uh, both of those locations, as well as the um, different homicide conferences that I've attended, as well as the annual ones where homicide investigators uh, get together from Western Canada, so we say often in Alberta, they, they put one in yearly, uh, and we sit down and we go over cases what was good, what was bad, what worked, what didn't, what happened when we got to court, where the pitfalls were. So it's always, a, it's always ongoing training, if you will. If we see uh, sharing of information between departments, does that make a difference in the investigative roles? Between Edmonton and Saskatoon or Vancouver or something like that? Absolutely. Uh, and there's been several instance, I think if you follow the news at all on, on different things that have happened in the city, there's always going to be uh, 
something goes on, or not, I shouldn't say always, but often there'll be a link between different agencies because somebody has information the other one has, and we, I shouldn't say we all know each other, but the strong contacts go back and forth. More so particularly around Saskatoon, for example, Saskatoon Major Crime works with the Saskatoon RCMP Major Crime. Uh, we border each other, sometimes a crime happens inside the city and ends up outside the city and vice mm -hmm. versa. We all pretty well know each other locally and uh, we exchange obviously information all the time. Where does the department go on a go forward basis, let's say in the next you know, six months to two years? Do you see any uh, curves that you're trying to meet in terms of uh, providing service for the citizens and the families that are there? There must be some satisfaction when you do close a file. The satisfaction when you close, particularly some of these old cases that have languished, if you will, uh, while we're waiting to advance them, uh, the satisfaction in those cases is immense. Um, it's, it's one thing to get a pat on the back from your boss, which is all good, uh, but there's nothing like the, the hug from a family if you're able to uh, successfully conclude one. Going forward, uh, I don't see as necessarily expanding what we do in historical cases. The reality is we have fewer and fewer historical cases because simply sciences, those types of things, the investigative tools uh, available to police investigators are far advanced. So there's fewer cases, shall we say, fall to the side. So if we can keep on moving forward, reducing our, our number of historical cases or unsolved cases, uh, I think we're going to be in good stead. I think that's marvelous that the department stays abreast of all the advances in science and uh, investigative techniques. I, I want to commend you and the uh, Saskatoon Police Service for all your work. I wish you every success in closing these files and uh, onward ho. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good. We'll be right back after this message. <laughs>